cyborgs. That's the word the media tends to use to describe those impaired people fitted with advanced rehabilitation technologies. Cyborg is short for cybernetic organism, a word created by scientists in 1960 during the space age to describe an organism with advanced or novel abilities achieved thanks to its intimate fusion with artificial components or technology. Those rehabilitation technology seem so advanced that they are now being advertised as soon even able to enhance and augment the possibilities of the healthy. That is why the media doesn't hesitate to give those people the name of real life cyborgs. The media showed us, for example, this man, amputated after being electrocuted in a work accident, and who was recently fitted with a smart bind link limb, so advanced that he can now even play the piano. There was this young guy, partially paralyzed from a car accident when he was 25, which left him without mobility of his lower limbs, and who now leaves his wheelchair at home, stands up, walks, even climbs stairs, thanks to a sophisticated exoskeleton. That is to say, a robotic metal armor which moves and supports his body. Or this tetraplegic woman, suffering from spinal cerebellar degeneration, which left her fully paralyzed for 15 years, and who now can control a robotic arm to sip coffee or eat chocolates, thanks to a brain implant decoding her thoughts. We could actually spend hours discussing recent stories not shown here, like patients who survived months thanks to an artificial heart, or blind people seeing again thanks to artificial implanted retinas. At first sight, it looks that our reality is coming closer to all the myth of science fiction, and that the body of Robocop or the hand of Luke Skywalker are now real things. It seems that we are progressing in the direction of the hopes of the transhumanists, who dream of a utopia of an improved humanity able to fight against aging, pain, and of course, death, thanks to technology. Those transhumanists who believe that we could or actually should all ultimately become some sort of cyborgs. Yet, with the sensationalism in science and technology journalism, with our society craving technological novelty and science fiction, and with those strong influential transhumanist ideologies, it is becoming very difficult to see past technology sensational successes, hard to see its limitation and how it works and its risks and costs. Tools that repair the human body could tomorrow be turned into enhancement technology and raise numerous questions about the inequality in society, about the loss of liberty, or the respect for human life and its diversity, among other fundamental ethical questions. We are on the verge of processing technologies that are going to force us to make some ethical decision, but we don't have the understanding yet to make those decisions. So what I want to show you today is the reality, a behind the scenes look at all that flashy technology. I want to show you the human with his tool, and you'll see that becoming a cyborg is not and will never be simple nor free in any sense of the word. Those rehabilitation technologies are indeed expensive and, they will, and will probably remain for a while. So money plays a, a role in that cost. But what I really want to discuss today are the hidden costs of becoming a cyborg. So let's have a look back to our example. Let's see how it works and where is the magic in those cyborg projections. Let's look at the first case. How does a bionic prosthesis really repair or enhance amputees? The most advanced available bionic prosthesis are called myoelectric, since they use the electrical signals from muscle contraction for control. Basically, an amputee has to contract two individual muscles of, from his thumbs, which are read by external electrodes placed over the skin. The activation of a prosthetic joint is triggered by a specific muscle contraction. For example, an arm amputee must contract his biceps to close the hand, the prosthetic hand, and his triceps to open it. Sounds rather simple, but actually, have you ever tried to contract those two muscles individually? Go ahead, try it. Try to contract your triceps alone. Yeah, that's right. At first, we don't even know how to do it. That's a new skill that you will have to learn. But anyway, that's not even the half of it, because to control with the same two muscles several prosthetic joints, like an elbow, a wrist, or a hand, or, poly or multiple finger, prosthesis user will basically have to learn some kind of a Morse code of muscle contraction. In short, one specific muscle contraction sequence for each joint, 
and a one by one joint control of the prosthetic joints. To master such complex skills, the price to pay is extended training and time. And even then, the control remains slow, limited, fatiguing, and so frustrating that a majority of amputees will end using their remaining arm instead. And possibly that the sophisticated prosthetic will end in a cupboard. One additional thing. Prosthesis do not convey any sensory feedback. Basically, prosthesis users don't have any sense of touch. Could you imagine what it would be like to play the piano without feeling the touch of the keys? One could think that seeing the hand moving or interacting is sufficient, but actually it's not. Seeing your hand touching is not touching. You can't see force or temperature. Grasping an egg, striking a match, or simply putting a key in a door lock without the sense of touch, even with vision, is something actually incredibly difficult. Imagine the concentration needed to grasp a beloved hand while not crushing it. What I'm describing here is current available devices, but some progress has been made in the last decades of research and development. Research could offer you an improved prosthesis with multiple electrodes and sensors, possibly directly implanted into your muscles, and an artificial intelligence, AI, to decode in a smarter and more precise way your motor intentions. That's the kind of improvement our pianist here got. Or you could get a nerve surgery to increase your motor control, your muscle control abilities, or to restore some basic sensory feedback through the electrical stimulation of amputated sensory nerves. But no matter how similar to a natural sensory motor circuit this gets, you will never recover the richness of the control and the perception we naturally have with our limb. And everything will have to be learned again. So in the end, if you're still in to play the piano with such a prosthesis, you should rather aim at playing a happy birthday song rather than a sonata. If you have a look to the exoskeleton case, we'll see that while hardware has progressed over the last ye few years, this remains a rather basic assistive device, which makes your hips and knees move along a predefined trajectory. The user can trigger some basic action, such as stand up, walk, or possibly climb the stairs through the use of a remote and movement sensors placed over the trunk. But what you have to keep in mind is most available devices require the users to stabilize themselves with canes, which is not an easy task. So you better have to be an athlete to use such an exoskeleton. But at the same time, don't expect running, cycling, or jumping with it, because those devices will never be as versatile as our body is. Try to imagine in your daily life only being able to use four generic functions of your legs. And try to imagine what it would be like to stand up or walk while not feeling the lower part of your body. Those exoskeletons allow a paraplegic to stand up again, which is something amazing from a psychological point of view, physiological and even technical point of view. I don't deny that. But if you start considering the functionality, the physical and cognitive cost of use, and the level of autonomy, the real price of using an exoskeleton is skyrocketing. Finally, let me give you more information about the brain implant, since it's often advertised as the ultimate solution to all our problems. What is important to understand is that no one can read minds. No one. Not even highly sophisticated robotics connected to a brain implant. At best, we can recognize a set of several states that both a user and an algorithm have been trained to work with. For example, roughly, we can train you to exhibit a set of several states a very simplified example would be thinking to a moving red square or a static blue circle, and then train an algorithm to recognize the brain activities associated to those states. Once it works, you could trigger some robot action with those several states. Looks appealing, but actually there are numerous issues, among which the difficulty to measure precisely and thoroughly the brain activity. Also, there are actually a thousand ways to think about a red square or blue circle, so to reproduce a thought is particularly challenging. The result is that in an experiment like the one shown here, the patient was able to control only five functions of the robotic arm, four different movements of the robotic arm, and one grasping action. But she had to train for five years to be able to successfully perform this task in the lab. Could you imagine the energy 
the self the frustration the self sacrifice and the surgery this represents just to achieve just such a simple task that's a hard price to pay so now that you have a better understanding of how th those technology works and that we have a look back to our initial picture in your opinion where does the magic comes from Behind the achievements of these amazing technical assistances, it remains above all a human performance. A human who sacrificed endless hours, energy and concentration to relearn to partially control with limited sensation a barely repaired modified body. And that is a significant price to pay for those cyborgs. What you might now realize is how biased our perception of technology is. And this is not surprising since most of the communication made on those topics transmit the following ideas. And this is not surprising since most of the communication made on these topics transmit the following ideas. First, the idea of the technology as the only solution. While sometimes it's not the most advanced devices that is the most useful. Then the idea of technology that by nature is more efficient, more performant than the human body, which pushes, which pushes us to see enhancement when it's only repair. And finally, technology that works instantaneously and provides you perfect control and feeling for free. As we saw, the question of the cost is not only financial. Even if one day we're able to perfectly reproduce the human body and to build effective replacement uh, versatile limb or organs, this swapped body will still have to be learned again. This new body will never be the one we knew, the one we took years as babies to master and a lifetime to know, to feel and to inhabit. Nothing will replace that at least not in an instant. Of course, one could think that future technological development could improve this situation. But should we place all our faith in technology alone? As scientists and engineers, I believe that we should be reconsidering our vision of the cyborg through that human prism. This should drive the development of those technical devices by focusing on all the human factors to enhance user experience rather than developing complex complex and usable sci-fi looking systems. I believe that we should also guide people's choice, make them aware of the hidden costs, and focus on teaching them the use of technology to avoid both disappointment, surprise, and rejection the day they might become dependent on this device. Finally, I want to show you one more thing. This is Manami Ito, a Japanese nurse who lost her arm in an accident 15 years ago, and who is still able to play the violin with a simple mechanical prosthesis, without motor, electronics, implant, nor AI. Just pure skills. When you listen to violin virtuoso, you don't congratulate the violin for the performance. So the next time you see an amazing cyborg, an amazing patient wearing rehabilitation technology, look past that technology, so that you can really admire and praise the human performance. Thank you.